Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'm going to talk about Guildhall. This is a set collection card game with a light engine building mechanic and a whole bunch of player interaction thrown in. First, I'm going to go over the rules, and then I'll tell you what I think. In Guildhall, there are six different professions and five different colors that consist on these cards. What we're trying to do is create sets, also known as chapters, for each of these guilds, which can be turned in for victory points. A set is only completed when there is one of each of the five colors in the game inside that one specific guild. So how do we go about doing this? Well, on our turn, we have two actions which can be chosen from three different options. The first option is to play a card from our hand. We'll pretend this blue farmer right here was in our hand. Now, when you play a card, there are a couple things to note. The first thing is that you do not immediately put it into your ongoing chapter that's in front of you. You put it in front of your chapters and only at the end of your turn you take all these cards that might be up here and put them into their corresponding chapters. The second thing to note is you're not allowed to play a card into the action area that exactly matches a card you already have inside your chapters. So if I had a green farmer in my hand, like I potentially do over here, I would not be able to play that card into the action area because I already have a green farmer. The third thing to note is that you're not allowed to play uh, the same guild twice in a turn. So if I played the farmer as my first action, then my second action would not be able to be the farmer. So how do these cards work? Well, we see we have rows on the cards and all these cards in the game, and then a number on the left-hand side. And this correlates to the number of that specific type of card you already have in your chapter. So in this case, I have a single farmer in my farming guild, and I go to the one farmer row, and that means I get a single victory point from the bank. If I had had three or more farmers over here, then I could have taken two victory points from the bank instead. One thing to note, you're always allowed to evaluate whatever row up to and including the one that you, um, you qualify for on a card, but you have to do everything that's on that specific row. The second type of card is the dancer, and the dancer is very easy to evaluate. You simply draw cards equal to the number of dancers you have inside of your chapter. So in this case, I would draw four cards. And once you've done that, you get another action, which is great. So the dancer pays for itself action-wise, and you'll get three actions on that turn. I'd also like to note there is no hand limit in this game, so you can go well beyond your initial hand of six. The third type of card is the Assassin. Now the Assassin, you'll see, has a zero here, which means it can actually do its bottom row with zero Assassins already in your chapter. So we'll see here it says you get to kill one card in an opponent's guild hall and put it into the discard pile. If I had had two Assassins, I could have killed two different cards in a single opponent's guild hall, but they would have had to be from two different chapters. And at the four level, I could do two from the same chapter, which is quite powerful. The Historian is the counterpoint to the Assassin. And at the zero level, the Historian lets you essentially take the top card from the discard pile and immediately put it into the applicable chapter, as long as it's legal with the color. At the two level, which I have right here in front of me, I would actually be able to look through the entire discard pile and choose a card that I both want to and legally can play, and, uh, and I put it immediately inside the chapter. At the four level, you can draw two cards. At this point, I'd actually like to point something out, and that is that if I had done this, if I had taken this blue dancer and put it on top of my dancers here, then immediately this would have um, completed a set. And whenever a set is completed, you turn it over and you put it off to the side. And uh, that happens even in the middle of your turn, even before you take the cards up here and shuffle them all down. You, uh, and once you have a completed set, there's nothing any opponents can do about it. The fifth type of card is the Weaver. The Weaver lets you take cards directly from your hand and put them into your chapters, bypassing the whole playing the card first bit. At zero Weavers, you can put one card from your hand directly into the applicable chapter house. At two, you can put two cards down from your hand, but you have to pull one up. This can actually be pretty powerful if you wanted to like pull up a farmer and then play him again later on that turn or in a following turn. You can get more victory points out of the farmers by pulling them back up with the Weaver. And at the four level, you can put as many cards as you want down from your hand into your chapters, but you have to pull two back up again. The last type of card is the Trader, and this is where another bunch of the uh, player interaction comes into play with this game. At the zero level, you, sim you simply give one opponent one of your cards, and you get one of his cards, of your choice. At the two level, you give him, him or her two, and you take two. But this has to be legal, so you have to make sure they can accept both the cards you want to give, and that you can accept both the cards you want to get back from them. At the four level, you can actually trade an entire chapter for an opponent's entire chapter. So I could give an opponent my entire chapter of one card and take their chapter of four. It could be a pretty big swing. So for the second thing that we can do on our turn, 
is uh, discarding cards from our hand and drawing new ones. So you can discard as many as you want, and then you draw back up to six. In this instance, maybe I don't need a second blue historian, and I don't need a second purple dancer, and this green farmer isn't doing anything for me because I already have a green farmer. So I could discard those three cards and then draw three more cards, getting me back up to six cards. The third thing that you can do on your turn is you can spend your completed sets of uh, chapters in for victory points. So the top of these cards here shows you the number of chapters it costs to take that specific victory point card. This nine card over here will cost two chapters, where all of these only cost a single chapter. Uh, down on the bottom is a little action box, and this is something that happens immediately once you take that victory point card. And this can be really quite interesting. For instance, two victory points doesn't seem very much, but you can see you can steal an opponent's entire, uh, entire chapter, not completed, and put it into your guild hall. Over here at the three, you can put as many cards from your hand as you want into your current guild hall. Uh, at the four, you just can get another action, which could do something that's really great. For instance, you could buy two cards, you could spend an action to buy a card and get a free action to buy another one. Over here, we can just draw five cards. The nine doesn't have any action space on the bottom, but that's just because it has a lot of victory points associated with it. The game ends once at the end of a turn where one person has 20 or more victory points. So uh, that's pretty much how the whole game plays. Now I'm going to jump over and tell you what I think about it. All right, I'm going to begin with things that I really like about Guild Hall. And the very first thing that popped to me was how you're building these small little engines uh, in your chapters down here. And as you add cards, you get more and more powerful effects. But as you add cards, it gets harder and harder to make each little engine better because there are less legal cards that can be played. You know, for these dancers, there's I can only play a blue dancer and there's only four of them in the entire game. Whereas this farmer can take every non-green farmer as, as a playable action. Uh, and, you know, to balance that, when I play this farmer with the little guy, I get a weak action. But when I finally get that blue dancer, it's going to be big. And I'm going to draw four cards and then I, you know, get this guy and I draw the four cards. I complete this, I can turn this into victory points, that's great. And then, uh, an, uh, the next part that's really cool about this whole mechanic is that I now have no dancers. If I have three dancers in my hand that were just dead to me because I couldn't play them because I already had four out, now I can start playing dancers out on the following turns and working through my hand and building up a little engine again. It's just really neat. Uh, the next thing that I really like about this game is how every single role seems to have a place in the game. Like, no role in particular seems more powerful or less powerful than the others. And uh, and how they, they combo really well together. You know, the farmer might seem kind of boring and weak. He just gets you victory points, but you need victory points to win the game. And when you pair a farmer up with the weaver, like I said in the rules, well, that could just be really powerful. You know, if you have four farmers down in your chapter, and then you play a weaver to pull one of them back, and then you play that as your second action, the one you just pulled up with the weaver, you're generating two more victory points, and it's just it's just really, really cool. Um, you might be in the situation that I was just in where I didn't have this blue dancer, and uh, you know that an opponent has a blue dancer. And so there are a couple different options you have. You could play a trader and give them a card to take their blue dancer, or maybe you don't have a legal trader in your hand, but you could play an assassin to kill that blue dancer, and then as your second action, you play a Historian to take the Blue Dancer you just killed and go into here and complete it. So there's lots of different ways that you can get around the fact that there are fewer and fewer legal cards that you can play because you can see them in other people's uh, decks. Uh, and also, you know, as the Historians are interesting because at the beginning of the game, they're very weak because this card pile will be tiny. But late game, your discard pile is going to look like that. Or maybe not late game because you cycle through the deck, but at various phases in the game, the Historian gets more and more powerful because... You're not allowed to look through this before you've played the historian, but you can remember what might have gone in there, or you might just say, the odds are really good, the card I need is in there. <laughs> uh, especially once people have started completing sets, you know? If someone um, completes a set and then pays for it for victory points, they put that into the discard pile, and now everyone knows there's at least one of every color of that specific role, and if you kind of remember that, then that can be really good for you. So, just the way... Um, there are other combos as well. It just I really, really like how... The cards all work together in a very interesting fashion. Uh, the next thing that I'd like to mention is uh, this game. This is uh, something I like about the game that I don't necessarily like the chaos of the game. That this game can have a little bit of chaos, but I like that you can control the chaos 
because at least in the uh, the base game, if there's an expansion for Guild Hall I haven't purchased, uh, and I know it, it changes this, and that's actually the reason I have not purchased the expansion, is that in the base game of Guild Hall, nothing can affect your hand. There is no card that an opponent can play that's going to pull something out of your hand. So you, you're safe with the cards you have in your hand. You can decide whether or not you're going to play a card um, out there. Because once you play a card out there, it's, it's very vulnerable to assassins and traitors and that kind of stuff. But if it's in your hand, it's totally safe. And you can plan ahead and wait for the right moment to play your cards out. Uh, I know the expansion has a card that lets you take cards from other people's hands. And that's honestly the reason I haven't bought the expansion. Um, all right, so those are the, the things that I... I re oh, actually, one other thing. Uh, going in with the cool combos. This victory point system is just really, 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 really cool. That you have this, um, you know, these, these completed sets that you can spend to buy victory points. But almost every victory point has these varied actions that let you combo into other things. I mean, some of them are really mean. You could steal entire chapters of the people, like I said. Um, and this is just uh, a couple examples of the things you can do. There are more in here. There's a, there's a 7.1 that gets you two actions, and oh, I think it's a 7 point. Don't quote me on that. But there are, there are lots of different options in here that add a lot of variety to your turns to, so that you can, you just, there's so many ways to combo and do the things you really need. It's just, it's just really, really cool. The, the victory points and these cards go together. So um, I'm going to go into the things I'm kind of neutral about, like things I want to point out. I'm not sure if they're particularly good or particularly bad. The first thing is that the iconography in this game, while it took a little bit to get used to. The first few games, I had to have the rule book out and just had all these things, and this got passed around quite a few times as people wanted to double check. I mean, the eyeball makes sense, but I don't know, just something about it. It took at least half a play before people really started to sink in and totally understand the icons. I don't think the icons are bad. I can't imagine them doing them better, but there's a lot of them on the cards. So uh, for a couple people, that was a... Some people are a little slower at... Um, getting those into the brain than others, but not, not particularly a problem. Uh, the next thing is, is really just the analysis paralysis problem, or actually in this game, the trader paralysis problem. Uh, these five rules, not much AP involved, but when the trader, when someone played a trader, uh, everyone else at the table kind of went, okay, well, this, this might take a little bit, because especially if, uh, if you're uh, playing in a three or four player game, there's just a lot of options. You play a trader and there's you have all these cards you can give, and there's all those cards out there that you can take and what do you want what you probably want one card but if you're playing the two level trader okay well what other card do you want to get and well do you want to target the person who's in the head or behind it's just the the analysis process is not is not terrible but especially with a lot of people around the table so, and if multiple people play the trader there can be the occasional very slow round intermixed with some quick rounds and that's mostly with the four player game i'm not going to say that the four player game this is bad um, a few of the, I played this seven times, a few of those games have been played four players, and they've been great. Um, uh, spoiler alert, I, I love this game, uh, and uh, even with four players it's fine, but occasionally, especially based on the personality of the people you're playing with, it, a certain turn or two can slow down pretty heavily when someone's trying to combo a trader with cashing in some victory points to do some big mega turn, and sometimes it's, they, they, they think, I can win this turn, Please give me a couple minutes, and <laughs> I think I, I think I can puzzle this out and get it. But like I said, that's pretty much always just with a trader. With the rest of these cards, turns are relatively straightforward, and uh, yeah. Oh, uh, and also going into that, going back into the chaos I mentioned. Unfortunately, you can only do so much planning on your turn. You can plan with the cards you have in hand because there's nothing that's going to happen to those. But any plan that you're making on someone else's turn that involves the cards that are in front of you, you have to keep in mind that. This state could be so completely different by the time it gets back to you. Someone might steal an entire chapter from you. They might swap this card with that card. You might get... You, and it's not always bad. I mean, especially with the trader, someone might unwittingly give you cards that work really well with the cards you have in your hand. It just... Uh, there's only so much pre-planning you can do when it's not your turn, unfortunately. Um, now I'm going to shift into the things I dislike about this game. And I'll be totally honest. I was only able to come up with one thing... And it's, it, it almost could be a neutral. It, the one thing that I potentially have a problem with is that uh, you can sometimes just know you're out of this game. Like, you can be three quarters of the way through the game and you're just looking at your piles and you're looking at your victory points and you're looking at your opponents and you're like, that person, there's just nothing I can do. That person over there is going to beat me out. They just, for some reason, maybe they played better, maybe they got a little bit more lucky 
Although I don't think luck is that huge in this game. There's a lot of room for very intelligent play to get you ahead. Uh, just sometimes there's just one player and they're at eight points and someone else is at 17. And it just, those last two turns around the table or so, they just, they're kind of checked out because they know they're, they're, they know they're not going to win. And sometimes, you know, someone says, well, I'll get the best points I can. I'll shoot for third. And that's fine. But um, also just, the there you can, there there really is no catch-up mechanic in the game. There's lots of leader bashing potential, but once again, once they, you know, once you have a completed set over here, there's nothing anyone can do about that. If you have a massive hand, there's nothing anyone can do about that. Uh, so, I don't know. It, I'm not going to say there's a runaway leader problem with this game at all, but every now and then there's a, um, a run-behind follower who just cannot catch up. Uh, but I'm really scratching to try and find things I dislike about this game. Uh, this game is excellent. I really, really love it. I'm kind of surprised I've only played it seven times. I'm looking forward to playing this one uh, another 20, and it's definitely going to stick around for me for a long time. I hope you've enjoyed my review. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thanks.